Okay, sequential ionization energies. The IB likes to choose magnesium or calcium because they have palindromic electron configurations. So don't get these two, which are easy to remove and are on the outer shell, confused with those two, which are harder to remove. They're the highest energy, ionization energy. They're on the inner shell. Sphere, propeller, donut sometimes, and f I don't know what the f flip that one is. Number three. Don't forget when you fill the boxes, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. For four, don't be tempted to put four here, it's three. Three D comes after the four S. Aluminium chloride is covalent with all that that implies because it's not an empirical formula, Al, Cl3, that would imply ionic, it's covalent. Scandium and zinc are not traditional transition metals. They don't have multiple oxidation states. They're not catalysts. They don't have colored compounds because they have an empty or a full D block when they are ions. Seven. Circle those and make the hybrid orbital with an energy in between the 2p2 and the 2s2. For sp2, make sure you circle the right ones. You want the empty one in the 2p when you make the hybrid orbital. Take that over. That gives you 1, 2, 3, makes sigma, and the pi comes from the p. It's remaining. Number 9, phosphorus pentachloride. Don't forget, it's not just 90 degrees. You also need 120 degrees for the equatorial chlorides. Sulfur hexafluoride, how do you draw that? You can't draw it going in and out. No, you can't. So you have to resort to a more 3D depiction. And that bond angles are 90 and apparently 180. That's the new answer. 90 and 180. That's ozone, one double and a single. No, it's not. It's resonance structure implies that the bond lengths, when measured, were one and a half what you expect of a single bond and one and a half the strength. Six ways to measure delta H. Energy diagram. Oh, that delta H is a bit too long. MC delta T. You can use bond energies. That's the third way. The fourth way is using Gibbs free energy equation. The fifth way is Born Harbor. The sixth way is using heat of formations, products minus reactants. Oh, and Hess cycles. So that's seven different ways to measure delta H. For the Born Harbor cycle, the only two that point down are electron affinity and heat of formation. And lattice energy can point up or down. The IB don't care, as long as you get the sign right. Don't forget the state symbols in the Born Harbor equation are important or it's wrong. Delta G, you can't measure G. Delta H, yes, but you can't measure, measure H. But you can measure S and delta S. And S is, of course, disorder. Why won't that be a one-step mechanism? It can't be a one-step, first step, a one-step mechanism because it would be a termolecular collision. It's very unlikely that three molecules will hit with enough energy, greater than activation energy, with the correct geometry. Here's a rate equation. If I double A, does K double? No, it doesn't. Not even times four. Only temperature and, and a catalyst will change the rate constant for a particular reaction. Number 19. Don't get these two graphs confused. No one can do them, so if you can, you might turn your six into a seven. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Lovely. The tiny numbers are the order of reaction with respect to the reactant. I've got three different sized containers. They contain the same liquid at the same temperature, and it is at equilibrium, which has the highest vapor pressure. And they're all the same. The only thing that changes vapor pressure is temperature. If it's at equilibrium, it's all going to be the same vapor pressure. Surface area, shape, none of that matters. There's a good old harbour process. Is that a homogeneous? Why? Because they're all gas? No. It's because they're all the same state. Once the IB did ask that and give you a point for gas, though. Is this a buffer? It's a strong acid and a weak base? No, it's not. Absolutely not. I need excess of the weak one, so I need excess weak base for it to be a buffer. I taught this for 20 years. It's completely wrong. Buffer prevents the change in pH when acid or base is added. No, that's wrong. Can you guess what needs to be fixed? A small amount of acid or base. Okay. And now I'm happy. 24. Simple salt hydrolysis. This is tricky. So I've written down three salts. 
So you have to work out what made the salt, and then you can work out the pH. So for the first one, it's potassium hydroxide and nitric acid. So that's going to be a strong base and a strong acid. For the second one, calcium hydroxide and nitric acid. Calcium hydroxide is a weak base. Nitric acid is strong. Ammonia, well, that's weak, and chloride comes from hydrochloric, so that's a strong acid, and so on and so forth. Now, the pH goes towards the strong reactant that made this. So that's, they're both strong, so it's 7. That's less than 7, the strong acid. That's also less than 7, strong acid. And if they're both weak, it's about 7. Here's a uh, titration curve. Half equivalence isn't on the syllabus, but that doesn't stop them asking about it. At half equivalence, the pKa of the weak acid can be found on that axis. This uh, Faraday's constant is not in the data booklet either, so you need to remember it. 96,500. SM1 is a two-step process for tertiary haloalkanes, and it's the fast one. One, two, three, bang. 28. This is nasty, an elimination reaction. If you've got alcoholic hydroxide, this is a one-step process. It's known as E2. Now, it's not clear to anyone if you need to know that E2 is the mechanism there. If you're going to be drawing out enantiomers, where one molecule is the reflection of the other, just be careful, because even the book that we use here gets it wrong. Make sure they're reflections of each other. 30. A bit of organic, so that's 1,3-cis difluorocyclobutane. It is cis, even if they're not on the, uh, next to each other in the carbon chain. And the polarimeter finally measures the rotation of plane polarized, because there's more than one sort of polarization, plane polarized light through a sample. 